Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Dr. Smith. I was sitting beside Eric Watkins for the last presentation, and after Dr. Vischer finished speaking, Eric said to me, that was a great presentation. I'd hate to be the next guy speaking. <laughs> but I am very uh, grateful to be invited to speak at this conference, and especially grateful to be a lot at the final slot to give the final word on this topic, to answer all of your questions, to give you the right view with which to leave and the right practice. Uh, unfortunately, I was unable to attend uh, my friend Eric's presentation last night because of a scheduling conflict. I understand that he talked about how Presbyterians raise children, and uh, this morning we're going to talk about how Christians raise children <laughs> in the church. <laughs> Just a couple of days, I was on the verge of tears. I was listening to university students present paper proposals on different dimensions of youth culture. I had a young man and a young woman present their topics, very bright and interesting individuals. And the young woman talked first about academic expectations and how stressful they can be for youth. The pressure that's put on them to excel in academics, pressure that's put on them by their parents, perhaps, or by society, to pursue a higher degree, to score excellent grades in their classes, to surpass their parents in terms of education, and the enormous stress that young people can feel because of that. The next individual who spoke talked about loneliness among youth, which is a very common phenomenon, even though youth are very connected socially. The data on youth loneliness is staggering. And for whatever reason, youth often feel disconnected, don't feel particularly loved or affirmed, feel like they're being left out, don't believe that they're being understood. And the reason I was brought to the verge of tears is because both presentations concluded with the idea that youth so often struggle in terms of these two areas and many more with suicidal ideation. Both students admitted that they had struggled with suicidal thoughts at one point in time, new individuals who had taken their lives and it's a little lens, isn't it, into the plight of adolescence in the church. And now I'm going to be talking about the pathway to maturity, but I want to focus in particular on adolescence, which is a particularly fascinating demographic. And I think we want to pose the question, how are adolescents faring in the church? How are they doing? And so I'm going to look at what some non-theological experts are saying about adolescence. We're going to be attentive to the, the voices of developmental psychologists and sociologists and philosophers. And then we're going to consider what the Bible says in terms of human development and adolescence. And then we're going to bring all of that together and tease out some implications for the church and talk about how we might renew practices in the church. How are adolescents faring? This is a, a difficult stage in life. And you have to be convinced this morning that adolescents and reformed churches are struggling with enormous questions and want to be helped by the church in terms of gender identification, in terms of sexuality, in terms of anxiety, in terms of suicidal ideation, 
And we need to be attentive to this demographic and be able to offer pastoral encouragement and help. Well, where does adolescence come from? There was a time, in fact, for most of world history, people generally distinguished only between childhood and adulthood. That's especially true of the pre-industrial world where you were a boy and then you became a man, a girl and then you became a woman. And this transition wasn't attached to a specific age but to other variables. If you were a boy and you were strong enough and big enough to do a man's work, you would be considered a man, whether you were 14 or whether you were 16. One would enter into manhood at a slightly different age, depending on one's abilities. Young girls were considered women when they were capable of being mothers. Again, it wasn't attached to a specific age. But with the industrial age, this all changed. And a new stage in human development was introduced. What you had in the industrial age was uh, the rise of factories, the migration, mass migration of people to cities. You had child labor laws forbidding children and youth from working in factories. You had the courts beginning to think of adolescence in a different way, a distinction between adults and juveniles the legal measures that were applied to adolescents were different than those applied to adults. They tended to be more corrective rather than punitive. And what is especially significant in terms of adolescence is compulsory education. Widespread among, throughout the Western world that youth were expected to be in school and I don't know if you can see the numbers, but in 1890, 6% of the population went to high school and 2% to college. In 1985, 90% of individuals between 14 and 17 went to high school and then 57 on to college. So what emerges then is a new subculture of youth who are uh, isolated from adults, in particular, to be a demographic of their own. Well, let's begin to think of how we might understand adolescence, and we're going to begin uh, with insights from developmental psychologists and theologians who've reflected on developmental psychology, and we're going to begin with James Fowler, who wrote a very significant book titled Stages of Faith. In fact, he wrote multiple books about this very topic, and we're not going to go through all the stages, but he believes that toddlers belong to what's called the mythic literal phase, where they interpret reality uh, naively, where they tend to understand words literally, where they play a lot of make-believe, where they live in a world often of fantasy. The ethical orbit they inhabit is black and white. Their moral conduct is regulated by laws. Do this, don't do that. They're motivated morally by rewards and by the threat of punishment. And then they move, Fowler says, to the synthetic conventional phase or stage where they go to school and they begin to meet people outside of their family, form friendships with individuals beyond their family, are introduced to ideas that may not be held within the family. And they discover that the ethical world isn't always black and white, it's sometimes gray. They're introduced to the phenomenon of moral dilemma. And this particular stage typically ends with some disappointment in traditional authorities. You know, if you're a school teacher, that until probably grade five, 
teachers are highly regarded and highly respected. They can almost do no wrong. They're almost like celebrities, right? Pastors, by the way, are also celebrities. Um, For very young children, as a pastor, you know, I sometimes, well, I often stand by the, the doorway when people are leaving the church, and the little ones will sometimes hug me, right, as they walk out. And at a certain point, they stop hugging me. And it, it doesn't, and then the disappointment sets in, right? This guy isn't all that great. Isn't all that we thought he was. Um, but then people move to an- another phase, the individuative reflective phase. There's cognitive development and skills and critical reasoning that are then applied to what they're learning and to how they see the world and what sets in is a measure of skepticism and a measure of, measure of cynicism, a measure of critique. They become deconstructive in many ways, trying to understand what really lies behind the signs that they are being given. And this phase ends with a desire for congruence in their life. What do we mean by that? Well, let's move on to Eric Erickson, who coined the term identity crisis. Many of us, I suspect, are familiar with that term. What what did Erickson mean by that? Well, for Erickson, who had this great life cycle theory, there were eight stages in this life cycle theory. Every stage had a conflict and a crisis that was resolved by the acquisition of a particular virtue. And the conflict for Erickson in the adolescent stage is between one's identity and one's role. Identity being how you see yourself, role being how society sees you, what society expects you to be. I think it's a very profound thought because it is what adolescents encounter. They see themselves in a certain way. They have particular dreams and ambitions and aspirations, but they struggle because their parents are sometimes giving them a different career path, are setting before them an alternative future that they may not like, and this could be true of the church, of course, and broader society. Think of how this might play out in terms of sexuality. You may feel yourself to be one thing and desire one kind of fulfillment, but everybody else is expecting something else of you. So it leads to conflict. You may may want to go on to university, but that may not be the expectation of your parents. You may want to pursue a career as a landscaper, but others are saying, well, that's not a noble vocation. And you should really pursue a career in a different area. Identity crisis that is then resolved by what Erickson calls fidelity, which is the capacity now to make adult commitments to be true to oneself, to have a clear sense of self-image, to be grounded in that self-image, not to be swayed anymore by the wishes of other authorities in your life, perhaps, to be convinced that this is the way to go and to find something to die for, which I find to be a very interesting phrase that Erickson uses, that adolescents, as they approach the end of this phase, let's say the end of their teenage years, are looking for someone or something to die for. Youth often have a a particular passion. And you see this, don't you, in jihadist groups in the Middle East, and sometimes even among North Americans. I don't know if you remember the story of John Walker Lind, who was an American boy who grew up in American suburbia, converted to Islam, became captivated by Islam, went to Yemen to receive instruction, ultimately joined an Al-Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan. He found something worthy of death, something to die for. 
Kenda Creasy Dean, who's written a phenomenal book, Practicing Passion, writes in this book, adolescents do not want to suffer, but they do desperately want to love something worthy of suffering and to be so loved. Something to die for, passion. Well, Erickson calls adolescence a moratorium on adult responsibilities, a timeout, a society-sanctioned timeout on adult responsibilities, to give children just a little more time before they enter into adulthood. Ben Sass, my favorite politician, is a U.S. senator in Nebraska and a reformed theologian. Uh, he was an elder in a United Reformed Church. I'm, I'm not sure where his affiliation is today. It might be PCA, but he's written a book called The Vanishing Adult, and he has a view similar to Erickson that adolescence is this moratorium on adult responsibilities, but what we're discovering is that the moratorium is lasting longer, and it's taking youth a longer time to enter into the responsibilities of adulthood. Well, if we think of the five major markers of adulthood as leaving home, finishing school, financial independence, marriage and children, these markers are not being attained as quickly as they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. In 1960, more than two-thirds of young adults had attained all five of these markers by the age of 30 in 2000. This was true of less than half of females, less than a third of males. 1960, 70% of 25-year-old women had attained all these markers in 2000, 25% had. 1960, the average age of marriage was 20 for women, 22 for men, 2010, 26 for women, 28 for men. That's U.S. data. What about Canadian data? 1960, the average age for the first birth of Canadian women. That's a poorly worded statement, isn't it? That's a, that's a very poorly worded statement. The average age when Canadian women first gave birth, does that capture it? 23.5, in 2010, 28.5. So I should, I included a parenthetical comment. This is applying to women who gave birth, doesn't include uh, women who hadn't. Uh, so it's not a measure of fertility. 1986, 15% of 25 to 35 year olds had a university degree. 2016, 35% did. 1981, 42% of 20 to 24 year olds lived at home, 11% of those 25 to 29, 2018, 63%, and 29%. This is all statistical data supporting uh, what's called emerging adulthood. This is a term that Jeffrey Arnett, a psychologist, coined in the year 2000 to describe this delay of entering adulthood. There's adolescence and now there's Emerging adult, the moratorium on entering into adult responsibilities is lasting longer. Adulthood is being delayed, and we can look at this and we can mock it, but we shouldn't. There are good reasons why this is happening. Eric Erickson himself said that in highly technological and industrial societies, we can expect that the moratorium will last longer because it's taking people a longer time to enter into a career in part because they're going for more education. It's more difficult today to buy a house than it was 20 years ago. It's far more expensive and a lot of you simply cannot afford the house. They're going into adulthood with far more significant debt. And so we sometimes joke about millennials living in the basement of their parents, but this is a, a real phenomenon that Emerging adults themselves are not always happy with. Well, I want to also talk about the, the wider cultural narratives that adolescents uh, hear and are influenced by. And I encourage you to read Charles Taylor's massive tome, A Secular Age, but he introduces us there to the age of authenticity, which he says arises out of uh, romantic expressivism, the big culprit here is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, who had this idea that uh, 
Human nature is pure and innocent. And if people are evil, it's because they're corrupted by society. Charles Taylor said that in the pre-modern world, people were porous. In the modern world, they're buffered. By porous, he meant we could be influenced from the outside. And we had moral authorities that were external to who we are. But in the modern world, and that includes the, the, the postmodern world, the authority is now internal. And we obtain our morality intuitively. That's what that quote is all about. Kenda Dean says, if you want to understand a society, look at the youth. Because the youth is the culture on steroids. And if there is this culture of authenticity, then we should expect, it to, find, we should expect to find it in particular among youth. And that's precisely what we find. I should make this distinction that we should talk about positive authenticity and negative authenticity. So I'm going to say, I'm going to be making the point that authenticity is a problem in our society, but I want to make clear at the outset that there is something virtuous about authenticity depending on how we're using the word. If we mean congruence between what one professes and how one lives, that is good authenticity. It's an authenticity that youth often crave. The single greatest reason why youth leave the church is because of hypocrisy in the church, incongruence between what one professes and how one lives between creed and conduct, between profession and practice. But what we're discovering among youth is this quest for authenticity that's negative and harmful. It's a congruence between what one desires and how one lives. And that's the cultural narrative in which they live, the narrative in which they are encouraged, in which many of them, even in the church, follow. That If I have these desires, I should be able to fulfill those desires, and if I don't, I'm inauthentic. I want to live out the person that I feel myself to be. What is, this, this might be the kind of creed of authenticity. There's a voice deep within us, which is the voice of nature, and therefore the voice of morality. It is this voice which can be heard through a connection with one's deeper and inner self that provides the moral compass to be followed. To deny this voice and follow another, the voice of pa parents, teachers, and pastors, is immoral. If you want to determine how to live, you need to look inward. You need to be sensitive to your deep inner core and listen to what your deep inner core is saying to you. That's the source of morality. You have to follow it. Here are the slogans of authenticity. Be true to yourself. Just be yourself. Follow your heart. Believe in yourself. Live out your desires. You hear this even in Christian churches. I was at a Youth for Christ meeting not so long ago and the youth were giving testimonies and a young girl stood up and said to the audience, I'm so happy for Youth for Christ because they instilled in me the need to believe in myself. But that's not what should be instilled in youth, especially if your organization is called Youth for Christ. This is all over Disney. We, because of Disney movies, and the wider cultural narrative, young people in the church have this view without even realizing it some ways. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break free. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Pinocchio, always let your conscience be your guide. Your moral compass is within you. Rex from Toy Story, you just need to believe in yourself. Cinderella, if you keep on believing, the dreams that you wish will come true. Don't give up. Keep dreaming. Aladdin, like so many things, it's not what's on the outside, but inside that counts. Don't go outside of yourself for some kind of external standard for morality. The standard for morality is within. It's on the inside that counts. It is internal. Now, Christian Smith, who's a sociologist of religion, has written three significant books on the religious lives of adolescents, 
teenagers, emerging adults, believes that within the youth culture, whether Muslim, whether Christian or Jewish, there is the emergence of a new religion that he calls, that I find even in Canadian Reformed churches and Canadian Reformed youth. He's calling it moral therapeutic deism. Moral because it's a kind of new religion that is ethical in nature, primarily about how to live, what is good and what is bad. Therapeutic because God is conceived of in therapeutic terms. He is there to help you, to make you feel better. Deism, because he's largely distant from the world, but will kind of enter into your life when you have a crisis and help you. I'll tell you where I observe this. When individuals are interviewed for a profession of faith, the kinds of answers that you hear are often reflective of moral therapeutic deism. Uh, Share with me, we'll say to young people, your testimony. They'll say, I firmly believe that there's a God who's in charge of the world, who has mapped out a destiny for me. Uh, Tell us uh, something about why it's so good to believe in this God. Well, sometimes when I'm in trouble, I can pray to him and I feel better. I feel grounded. He helps me. God helps me through the difficulties in life. What's problematic with that? What's problematic about that is Christ isn't mentioned. And if you were to survey people on the streets of Hamilton or Toronto, you would probably get the same answers. This is not Christianity. Most people in Canada still believe in God. And what they would hold to is a kind of moral therapeutic deism. We have to ensure that young people in our church, when they make profession, are professing faith in Christ and loyalty to Jesus and surrendering their lives to him. Human development is a metaphor for redemptive history. We're moving now to the biblical perspective on adolescence. I find it striking that the Apostle Paul, Galatians 3, says, so the law was our guardian unto Christ. What's the implication there? That Israel in the Old Covenant was in her minority. Israel was a child who needed a babysitter, who needed a pedagogue, who needed a guardian to bring her to Christ. So Paul is saying, Human development is a metaphor for redemptive history. That works out quite well. If we think of Adam and Eve in the garden, how did they begin? They began like babies and like toddlers. I think that's what it means that they were naked and not ashamed the same way that toddlers are naked and not ashamed. They they run around, right, without being bothered that they're unclothed. Sometimes people think that on the new earth we're going to be naked again. That's not true, God is clothed in glory. Clothing is a good thing. And over time, Adam and Eve were to grow up and and acquire clothing. Well, I think what we we could see this um, in terms of Old Testament history, there seems to be a, a bit of a movement from an era in which priests are dominant, you know, the early chapters of the Bible, the the Pentateuch, the priests feature very prominently, to a time period when kings become prominent, and then finally to a time period when prophets are dominant. And and maybe there's insight here into the progression of human development. By the way, these insights are are funded by uh, some of my theological mentors, James B. Jordan, Peter Lightheart, and Alistair Roberts. Uh, When the priests were dominant, what was the orienting perspective? The law, commandments, do this, don't do that. The life of the priest was quite simple. He had to make very basic judgments. Is this sacrifice appropriate or isn't? Is this person clean or isn't he? It was a simple life, a kind of a black and white world where the orienting perspective was law. The orbit in which priests' work was quite narrow. It was the temple. And so the priest kind of reflects a young child. You move to the era of kings where the orienting perspective is no longer law, but now wisdom. Solomon is presented with a moral dilemma, a situation for which no law applied. Two women came to him, both claiming to be the mothers of the same child. There was no law that addressed this. What he needed was 
wisdom. Wisdom isn't counter to law, but wisdom is more than law. Wisdom includes the internalization of the law. The orbit in which the king worked as greater than temple now included the land of Israel. And finally, the prophets become dominant. And their orienting perspective is, you could say, vision, you could say perception, you could say judgment, you could say mission. It's more than the law and it's more than wisdom. They have constructive and deconstructive capacities. They tear down, they build up, they see new realities. And the orbit in which they work is now even greater. The whole world is brought into view. Jonah goes to Nineveh, Daniel's in Babylon. The prophets speak to the whole world. And that's the life of an adult. And if you were to compare this kind of development with what developmental psychologists are saying, you would see a lot of parallels. The young child is oriented by law, lives in a black and white world. The last uh, stage in Fowler's stages of faith is, he calls it a universalizing faith, and he says many people don't attain this phase, but Martin Luther King and Gandhi are examples, and Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream, right, for a, a, a reality beyond what he was experiencing which, experiencing, which is kind of prophetic, but the point is the adolescents are in this phase where life is no longer lived by laws, but now by wisdom, wisdom that needs to internalize the law. It's not against the law, but it's the internalizing of the law. Well, how can we minister to adults today? Let's think in terms of profession of faith. Uh, where does profession of faith come from? Well, it was introduced at the time of the Reformation to correspond to Roman Catholic confirmation where the bishop would confer the Holy Spirit on those who had been baptized. A priest could baptize, only a bishop could confer the Holy Spirit. And so baptized children in the Roman Catholic Church were at a certain point, usually age of seven, confirmed. And the biblical basis for that was Acts 8, when Peter and John came to Samaria and conferred the Holy Spirit on the disciples who believed but had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Martin Bootser introduced profession of faith as a kind of, in fact, these are his terms, I think, even, evangelical confirmation. And his rationale for doing it is this. Uh, typically, there's a testimony at baptism, when an adult is baptized, at least. He gives his testimony, or she, and then is baptized. For Bootser, infants are baptized, and then the testimony follows rather than proceeds. Even Carl Deddens uses the language of the testimony is delayed, so it ordinarily accompanies baptism. In the case of adult baptism, an infant is baptized and the testimony is delayed. I think that's problematic for a number of reasons. We can talk about that later. John Calvin has very similar views on this. He says the testimony is meant to confirm and ratify. Those are interesting verbs because of the verbs, those are the verbs that the Roman Catholics used of confirmation. Um, what this testimony then that children gave before the church was also then the door to the Lord's table. What should a child know or have in order to be admitted to the Lord's table? Well, Calvin, you know, they should be capable of discerning the body and blood of Christ, examining one's own conscience, and, and so forth. The Westminster Larger Catechism, only to such as are, as a, as are of years and ability to examine themselves uh, Vendelin and Monsma talk about these need to be true believers, these need to be regenerate. Abraham Kuyper, morally responsible people. Rutgers, knowledge of the essentials. At what age should a person make profession of faith and receive full communion and enter into all the responsibilities of the church? You, you'll see a, a kind of progression that that, that uh, parallels entrance into adulthood. There's kind of an emerging in adulthood, you might say. For Calvin, it was 10 years old. For Bootser, 10 to 12. Rutgers mentions it was 10 to 12 in the southern countries. It was 14 in the Palatinate, where the Heidelberg Catechism was written, and the northern countries. Again, Rutgers is my source there. Rutgers and Kuiper were uh, contemporaries. 
And Rutgers says in his day it was 15 to 20, Kuiper 16 to 23. When is a child able to enter into the full communion of the church, all the responsibilities of church membership, and have the capacity to fulfill all the requirements of 1 Corinthians 11 in terms of examining the body, or examining oneself, discerning the body, proclaiming the death of Christ, and so forth. Well, here's my modest proposal. I think we should distinguish and separate admission to the Lord's table and the assumption of all responsibilities in the church. Let me flesh this out a little bit. I think you, we could have profession of faith and children admitted to the Lord's table as young as 10. They give a private testimony before the elders. Why so young? Because I don't see in Scripture the need for children to have great maturity in order to celebrate the Lord's Supper. I simply don't see that. One must be able to examine oneself. That's a, a verse which is routinely misunderstood. We tend to think of that as, let's, we ought to look at ourselves to see whether we're truly a believer. But it's clear from the context of 1 Corinthians that Paul is saying, you ought to examine yourself with, with respect to this issue. Are you being divisive in the church? That's the issue. A child of 10 is, is capable of uh, fulfilling that requirement. And moreover, a child of 10 should understand that he or she is a member of the church, is loved by Christ, should have access to the means of grace. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if youth were going through high school, partaking of the Lord's Supper, having access to the means of grace? It could, it beca it could become the source upon, upon which parents... Um, or the basis, I should say, upon which parents and adults solicit repentance. We could say, look, you are partaking of the Lord's Supper, and you need to live a life that's consistent with that. Now, if we're talking about membership vows and the assumption of all church responsibilities, voting and tithing and that sort of thing, well, 10 years old is far too young. 16 is far too young then it should be at least 18 years old. There, I think we're expecting a certain, uh, a certain uh, level of knowledge and maturity. One should then know the doctrines of the church, be conversant with the practices of the church, and that should be a public affirmation. I'm going to keep moving here. Okay, so let's conclude with this. I've got two minutes left. Ministry to adolescents, the most important thing in my mind is to present clearly to youth the ministry, the life, and the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that youth can know fully who he is. Trust in what he has done. And surrender their lives to his lordship. We should be talking about Christ in every catechism class. We should be summoning faith and loyalty to Christ in every catechism class to disabuse youth of the uh, moral therapeutic deism. Forge meaningful relationships with them and mentor them. Why is it that youth feel so isolated? Because they are isolated. And parents are overworking and they're leaving their kids alone and they're not building relationships with their kids. They're not sitting down on the couch or at the kitchen table and talking to them. There aren't people in the church who do this. I'm so happy that at Blessings Christian Church, where, where I pastor, we have uh, a, a time period where Pastor Hilmer gives a lesson to everybody there, and then we, they break up into small groups and there are youth leaders who meet with these small groups week to week, and they mentor them, and they know them by name, and they talk to them. Forge meaningful relationships, respect them, identify them by name, talk about their desires, dreams, and ambitions, and help them distinguish, help them to learn that not every desire is a good desire. 
You shouldn't be authentic to all of your desires. Some of them are very harmful to other people and to yourself. Help them distinguish between good and bad. Probe into their answers, dig deeply. I had a son who said to me once, he was 17 years old at the time, he said, I like it when you ask how we're doing and we say fine, and you don't accept, fine, but you force us to say a little more. He said, often we don't want to say more at that point in time, but we need to say more. We need to talk. Probe with youth. Don't accept the initial answer. Have them give an account for things, how things are really going. Expose the myths of negative authenticity um, it's just a myth that we should be true to our desires. Really? Who thinks that? We have very evil desires. The only people who think that they should be true to their desires, the only people who think that they are truly honorable people are narcissists. The myths of personal autonomy. You really think that you can live out your liberties without infringing on the liberties of others? That self-deception of the first order. And then finally, emphasize not simply moral conformity, obedience to commands, but character transformation. N.T. Wright, in his book, After You Believe, points out that the rich young ruler entered into a kind of disappointment with mere compliance with commands, and Jesus summons him to character transformation. Okay, you're obeying all the commands. Sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. You need to become a whole new person. Underscore the radical summons of Jesus to die for him. Youth are looking for someone to die for. Let's introduce him to Jesus. He's the one to die for. Stoke all of that passion for Christ. Recommend the practice of virtue, good and better. Reformed ch churches, I believe, are inhibited by an ethics of law where we think of life only in terms of right and wrong. I'm not sinning right now, therefore I'm doing well in my life. What about growth? What about good and better? What about habituating virtues? What about paying more attention to the fruit of the Spirit? And not just the Ten Commandments. Zacharias or Sinus, by the way, is very, very helpful here. You know, in his commentary on the Catechism, after each commandment, he has a list of virtues and vices associated with, with each commandment. We should begin to practice virtue so that we habituate them and develop good reflexes so that we are growing. So patient one day, more patient the next. And then lastly, point adolescence to wisdom literature. If uh, kingship matches adolescence, then the wisdom literature in the Bible is literature that's perfectly suited for adolescence. The Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes where you're moving beyond commands, don't do this, do that, to recognizing the patterns in creation and in life. If this happens, A, then B, if you trust in the Lord and rely not on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him, then B, it will go well with you. That's not a command, that's wisdom. Thank you very much.